Welcome to the London Politica podcast. This is where we join industry thought leaders and experts to uncover the nexus of politics, markets, and society. My name is Manas Chavla, and the guest joining me today is a fascinating figure who's worked on the front lines of both state and non-state geopolitics. He's a former British diplomat who resigned over the Iraq war, and he founded the world's first non-profit diplomatic advisory group called Independent Diplomat. He was also the subject of the BBC documentary, The Accidental Anarchist. Joining me today is Mr. Karn Ross. Thank you so much for being on the show. Thanks for having me. Um, so Karn, I just want to give everyone, uh, our, our listeners, a bit of a macro perspective uh, on, your, on your story, because you testified uh, in, a se- in secret to an official inquiry about the Iraq war, and then you went on to resign from your position at the FCO uh, after about a 15-year career in diplomacy. And I sense that sort of your disillusionment with, with the British government or perhaps more broadly the, the architecture of the international system or the way society functions started even earlier than that and kind of extends more broadly than Iraq. Tell me a bit more about that story. Well, it's a, it's a long story, so I'll try and be brief. But basically, um, you know, I guess there were two sources of disillusionment from the international and indeed the state system. One was simply looking at the outputs in terms of things that mattered to me, like inequality, the amount of carbon in the atmosphere. And I felt that those outputs made clear that the system wasn't working in terms of the problems that mattered to me uh, and indeed should matter to everybody. Um, But the more proximate cause of my disillusionment was indeed the Iraq war. I was the Iraq expert for the UK at the UN Security Council. So I knew quite precisely how the government manipulated the truth or the facts about what we knew about WMD weapons of mass destruction. So that was a a very disillusioning experience. But as you say, my disillusionment did go a bit broader than that. Right. And I mean, it's a very brave move. And and, uh, I think it's it's a unique perspective, sort of having that kind of whistleblower story, because there's plenty of people disillusioned with, with, you know, all these facts, but very few of them that sort of have seen uh, the system as closely as you have, and I think you know you mentioned once that sort of you you saw the intelligence uh, every single day for four and a half years on the sort of WMDs or lack thereof in Iraq. Um, how what, what was the most challenging part of that process of of, of saying goodbye to this this lifestyle and, and entering a new one? That's a good question. Um, I mean, obviously, I gave up a career that I thought I'd have for the rest of my professional life, so. I gave up a lot of security, a lot of status, because being a British diplomat does have a certain kind of status within certain circles. Um, I'm not sure it should, but anyway, um, uh, you know, I gave up a regular paycheck, an index linked pension. But I think the hardest thing was social, interpersonal, my relationships with my colleagues. That you're an intimate, close part of a team of people trying to achieve something and leaving that group and then indeed pointing my finger at that group in accusation uh, was emotionally quite difficult. Right. And, and I mean, sort of being kind of, again, you know, you know, at the very sort of table making these sorts of decisions as you did, I I think you saw very, very closely how these sort of countries interact and, and think about these sorts of problems and often maybe how that's really disconnected to what's going on at the ground level. Um, which kind of, you know, e- almost everyone agrees that the UN uh, isn't solving our problems in a way it should be. Um, and, and, you know, men, there's, there's a lot of consensus that maybe it's not fit for purpose. But do you think it's beyond repair, the way our international systems work? Do you think we need to completely scrap them and start over? Or uh, did you feel like there's, there, there's some path um, where, where sort of more modern changes can, can be fruitful? Uh well, I'm a revolutionary and I think the state-based system is, is part of the problem. The way states think, the way people representing and leading states think is a deep part of the problem. This idea of state interests is a completely manufactured discourse um, where officials like I was, diplomats, others, may literally make up what they think their country's interests are, usually without reference to the people concerned, to the populations yeah. concerned. And that creates a very artificial calculus, which often leads to conflict. Um, but at a minimum, I think, uh, betrays what people most want, um, you know, which is above all cooperation, exchange, travel, um, 
you know, the sorts of things that every population in the world wants. And yet we have a, a world system of, of competition and tension and frequently conflict. Um, so I, I do think there is much to be improved in the international system. The institutions uh, of the international system, particularly the UN, but also others, need to become much more open to diverse voices um, and pay particular heed, primary heed, to those who are on the ground and are most affected by the decisions of those institutions. Uh, and that's the very opposite of what happens in places like the UN Security Council, where the people on the ground are, are the last to have a say, are often deliberately excluded from the discussion. And I felt very strongly when I was there that that was not only very stupid because it denied these institutions of a form of information and intelligence, which was extremely important and cardinal, really. Um, but also it was deeply unjust uh, that the people most at stake were the most excluded. Uh, so in, in both ways, it, it was a very flawed system. And yes, I, I think it should be replaced by something better. And if not, it should be dramatically improved um, without being replaced. Either is possible. Mm. Uh, can actually welcome the next question because you, you know you went on to start independent diplomat where you know using your and, and your colleagues as diplomatic expertise you advised and supported democratic groups that sort of had otherwise been sidelined uh, in the international realm and I mean really it's the first of its kind you know uh, as as a group so I, I'm very curious to know how you came up with that from scratch and, and whether you faced any challenges in convincing people that this was a viable model you know we're so convinced that international <clears throat> that international affairs has to <clears throat> be such a sort of state-centric system was it hard to convince people that non-state actors can play an effective role in diplomacy um well before answering that i should just make clear that independent diplomat didn't just help non-state groups we also helped state groups we helped democratic countries that were seeking access to the diplomatic system who were in some way disadvantaged in the dis di diplomatic system often because they were very small so for instance we helped the marshall islands become a, a leader in climate diplomacy where it had a huge amount at stake an existential stake because it's a low-lying island in the pacific uh, acutely at risk of to sea level rise. So we helped states as well as non-state groups. Um, yeah, it was difficult. I mean, at first people were skeptical and um, it, it took a lot of convincing of people, particularly in the funding field. Ironically, the people who needed less convincing were actual diplomats who are part of the system. Uh, a lot of them immediately said, yes, this is necessary. This is very much needed. Um, we need to have these groups empowered to participate effectively in, in the diplomacy about them, that will make the diplomacy better. So they, they understood the logical argument very clearly. And, you know, it underlines that there's a lot of good people in diplomacy trying to achieve the right thing, whether it's peace or prosperity or, or whatever. Um, so, but outside of diplomacy, weirdly, there were a lot of people who were awfully committed to the state-based system, the system as it was, partly because they didn't understand it. And I think, you know, in, in America, where a lot of philanthropic funding is based, um, there is a, on the progressive side of things and progressive philanthropists, a very great commitment to institutions like the UN, that diplomacy, quote unquote, the UN is always a good thing. They didn't understand the flaws of this system or weren't prepared to see the flaws of this system. Um, so that was that was a harder struggle. Right. And it reminds me, I mean, you were, you were, is it correct that you were in second men to the UN and in, in doing sort of process in Kosovo, um, where, where you saw, uh, you know, that in the diplomatic process, there were many parties involved, including lots of states, including Serbia, but not, you know, not the actual democratic elected government of Kosovo. Uh, and, and that kind of really sort of shaped your perspective around, you know, how some of these things work. And it's interesting you mentioned, you know, diplomat, diplomat, real diplomats were sort of more easier to convince than others because they already saw the need for non-state perspectives and diplomacy. So I'm just wondering why wasn't it the case that, you know, these diplomats found a way themselves and then to, you know, uh, have these sort of non-state voices and then you know why did why, why was there a need for you to step in essentially um well it's a, it's a good question i mean i think good diplomats were seeking out these non-state voices were having contacts but in some cases they're actually legally prevented from having contacts where such groups are designated as terrorists for instance a, a label that is far too broadly applied and thus used to exclude 
otherwise legitimate groups. Um, not that I support terrorism, and not that independent diplomat ever worked with terrorist groups, because also uh, that designation prevented nonprofits helping those groups. But Kosovo was the inspiration for in, independent diplomat. To, to go back to your early question, you know, what was the the trigger for it? Because the not, the democratically elected government of Kosovo was excluded from the formal diplomacy about Kosovo, so there'd be meetings at the UN Security Council where every member state of the UN could speak, including Serbia, uh, which was deeply hostile to Kosovo's independence. Uh, but Kosovo itself, the democratically elected elected government of Kosovo could not speak and was explicitly prevented from having any diplomatic representation by a ruling from the UN Security Council. So that was a very clear case of exclusion where uh, enabling Kosovo's participation was a very important way to improve the diplomatic process about Kosovo to make it fairer and more intelligent in addressing issues like Kosovo's independence. Um, I mean, of course, diplomats talked to Kosovo's democratically elected government, but the fact that they didn't have any status in the talks, I think, did undermine their arguments. Um, you know, they were literally kept out of the room at the UN Security Council. I, I remember going with the delegation from Kosovo to a meeting about Kosovo, and the best we could get at the beginning was sitting in the public gallery watching this public meeting, this, this formal meeting of the UN Security Council, so-called public meeting, not very public, but so-called public meeting, um, where we were literally watching the proceedings from above in the sort of spectators gallery. And I was with the prime minister of Kosovo who'd been democratically elected. And here they were, all these member states of the UN talking about his country, often with great ignorance, frankly. Very interesting. And I, and, I mean, independent diplomat supported um, many, many different democratic movements. And as you say, sort of small states like that. And I think one of the most interesting to me uh, was uh, sort of your support for Western Sahara, um, particularly because sort of there, there's parallels that can be drawn between, you know, the Moroccan occupation of that region and sort of what we're seeing uh, going on, you know, uh, dominant in the headlines between Russia and Ukraine. Is that is that a connection you make? Uh, it's a connection I tweeted about this weekend that, that the US undermines its uh, opposition to the, Russia's occupation of eastern Ukraine uh, by its endorsement of Morocco's illegal occupation of the Western Sahara. It's not a parallel many people would see, but one that certainly I see. Um, you know, the US unfortunately supports the Moroccan position, uh, recognizing their occupation of West, Western Sahara, where the indigenous people of Western Sahara have been denied their legally uh, endorsed and UN Security Council endorsed right to a referendum on the future of the territory. Um, and independent diplomats supported the representatives of the people of the Western Sahara, the Frente Polisario or the Polisario Front for many years and continues to do so. Um, you know, who, who they represent the people who actually live there, who have most at stake, and who want a say in the future of their country, um, and oppose Morocco's occupation of their country. And it's hard to think of a more legitimate cause, but unfortunately, it's a very ignored cause. Very few people know about it. Mm. And and what are the sort of conflicts that that you know, conflicts or, or perhaps areas of geopolitical tension, perhaps you're keeping an eye out for uh, in 2022, because I think lots of sort of big name consultancies come out with, you know, their own lists. And, uh, you know, traditionally, they're the same sort of China, COVID, climate, cyber, but I think you bring a very interesting perspective. So is there something, you know, that you think that that might be sort of brewing in 2022 that uh, is often going overlooked uh, for most other sort of international affairs observers? Yeah, it's a good question. I, I don't run independent diplomat anymore. I stepped back from that role the year before last. So I'm not institutionally required to think about areas of tension. Um, but it's, you know, it's fairly obvious where there are tensions that are, are not getting the attention they deserve. Uh, Yemen, I think, is the big example where there is a hot war that's killing lots of civilians, including through starvation and deprivation. Um, which is not getting the diplomatic attention it deserves. There's a disgraceful Western-backed Saudi uh, campaign against the Houthis. Uh, it's a war that with the right uh, political will from the actors concerned could easily come to an end. Uh, and it's a war that's a stalemate and that, that should be getting much more international attention. Uh, another area that often strikes me as, you know, is commented on as an area of tension, but, but rarely, 
truly addressed is, is the Sahel, um, mm. uh, the nexus of, uh, of problems uh, stretching from Mauritania in the West to uh, Somalia in the East, and different groups concerned, but a, a connection of instability and to some extent Islamist um, uh, 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 terrorist groups, uh, militant groups who are active in, in that area. Uh, but I also think of Myanmar, which, you know, is definitely not settled where the, you know, the military have, have uh, uh, taken over, uh, denied democracy, uh, there are continuing ethnic struggles and battles in, in, in around the regions of Myanmar. That's not getting any attention. There's a long list, I'm afraid. Very long list. Um, I always like asking sort of people who've worked in foreign affairs and then sort of people who've been diplomats their thoughts on social media, because we've had uh, a few people on this podcast. We've had uh, Professor Tristan Naylor, who study this sort of academically. Uh, and I think you, you've seen a very interesting perspective, given how social media shaped, uh, you know, the entire Middle East during the Arab Spring, but also off the toxic effect and, and you know, positive polarizing effect it can have on discourse um, kind of in the sort of digital age. Um, I mean, broadly, what are your thoughts on it? And, and do, you, do you think it's, it's been a useful, if at all, kind of uh, supplement to diplomacy, especially in a sort of, you know, socially distanced COVID age? It's a good question. I mean, there's a long answer to this and the short answer. The short answer is, is that it's both good and bad. Uh, it's good in that it gives a platform to voices that are not often heard. Uh, you know, ordinary Palestinians during the bombardment of Gaza by Israel. You could, you could listen to them, read their tweets in, in real time as they were under attack. That was uniquely powerful. And I think much more powerful than the so-called representatives of the Palestinians talking publicly. So giving that voice to people on the ground, I think, is really important. Um, on the other hand, uh, social media is often used performatively uh, by states and their representatives to make, you know, rather crass public points. Uh, if you follow Russian social media accounts, for instance, at the moment, Russian government social media accounts, the Russian embassy in the UK is a good example. Um, you know, they, they put out these rather provocative and unhelpful, unhelpfully belligerent tweets, um, which I don't think add to the diplomatic, you know, process very much. Um, uh, I mean, it falls into the realm of public diplomacy, uh, which is a long-standing practice of states, you know, to try to influence the public discourse. But something about social media seems to encourage the 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 crass, the blunt, and the unhelpful. Um, in uh, perhaps it's the brevity of the form or the the governing tenor of the form of Twitter or indeed other social media channels. Um, so it's it's good and bad. Yeah, it's a complicated answer. Um, another thing sort of I found quite fascinating, and, and I'd been exploring this for a bit myself before, is, is uh, how complex systems theory sort of shaped your philosophy. Uh, and I found it quite interesting on its own, but I've never quite heard anyone make such a direct link between that and, and foreign affairs. Um, could you tell me a bit more about sort of that theory, how that theory shaped uh, your worldview, especially after you sort of resigned from the XO? Yeah, um, well, I've always been interested in models of political change, um, how change actually comes about, and always skeptical of the sort of chessboard view of international relations and, you know, country X makes move A and country Y makes move B and, you know, this rather discrete analysis of, of the actions of different actors influencing one another. And I've always think, felt that things were much, much more complicated than that. I mean, I'm, I'm talking in general, rather crude terms inevitably to make my point, but complexity theory gave me an insight. And I, I say, that it, say this saying, acknowledging that complexity theory is by no means the only tool that one should employ in understanding international relations. It's just one of, one of many. Um, but complexity theory gave me an understanding of how events can change, how things are connected, how those connections uh, can lead to alterations of the entire system, can ripple out to affect the entire system in ways that I found intriguing and helped illustrate change, political change, both domestically and internationally, in ways that I found convincing and compelling. 
but as I say, you know, it should not be used in exclusion to other tools. It's not, it, it, you know, there are other ways of understanding the behaviors of states, uh, but we must move beyond the sort of traditional discourses of realism or neorealism or, um, you know, the, the rather narrow definitions of governing of how states behave towards one another. Um, I, I definitely think, you know, for instance, another discourse that I think is quite important is emotional analysis, um, that uh, states and their leaders and politicians have an emotional set of drivers, um, which are very important in determining how they behave. Uh, and I think, you know, one could look at Ukraine, for instance, through that lens, and get, gather some understanding about what's going on, not a comprehensive understanding, but certainly some insight. Very interesting. <coughs> Excuse me. No, that's fine. Uh, certainly none that are sort of, you know, spoken about, or at least I mean, I study international relations at university and we're still sort of learning the same curriculum written largely by, you know, Waltz and Morgenthau and Eikenberry and Mearsheimer, right? But um, there's, and as much as sort of, yeah, I think in academia, we like to talk about uh, this buzzword interdisciplinary, uh, you know, I certainly haven't seen this kind of level uh, where we talk about properly sort of maybe the, the overlap between psychology and IR or, you know, between complex systems theory and such. Um, so it's only perspective I think needs to be sort of brought in. Um, and I think for me, the most fascinating part of that theory is this sort of notion that when a system, you know, reaches a state of complexity that's prime for change, uh, you'd call that criticality. And, you know, that's a situation where a single agent can, can trigger sort of profound change um, in the system. And, and a good example, as you've noted previously, is, is Mohamed Bouaziz, who was a Tunisian fruit vendor uh, who triggered the Arab Spring after a sort of act of self-immolation in, in 2011. And I want to make a bit of a segue here, because I think, you know, anyone who's, who's glanced at the headlines in the last month will, will know that we're seeing this unprecedented tension uh, on the Russian-Ukrainian border, where Russia has amassed about 100,000 troops uh, and any diplomatic engagement, and frankly, there's been a ton of it, uh, has been all quite unfruitful. Um, and I'm wondering, when you look at the situation, Karn, do you, do you see a system approaching criticality? In other words, uh, you know, are we just sort of waiting around for a Franz Ferdinand moment to happen? I think that's a very acute observation, uh, because I think, yes, is the answer. We are approaching that state. All the indicators on a number of different fronts, above all military, are showing high levels of tension. Um, you know, today there's going to be a meeting at the UN Security Council about Ukraine called by the US, the, the sole point of which is basically to uh, show how isolated Russia is internationally. Um, which is not helpful in terms of the diplom diplomacy. Um, and that too is an indicator of international tension. So yes, uh, across the board, the indicators are pointing towards a high level of tension. And we are in a state where one event could trigger a broader conf conflagration. Uh, I hope we're not in that state, but I think we well could be. Uh, say there was an outbreak of fighting, on uh, of serious fighting, um, in the Donbass region, or um, uh, you know something like MH17, wasn't it? That was shot down by Russian separatists um, over Ukraine. Uh, events mm -hmm. like this could trigger something much broader. So uh, there is a great, great need to lower each of those areas of tension through diplomacy. It's not just one mechanism of diplomacy. We shouldn't be relying just on the US-Russia talks. We should be opening up as many different avenues of communication as possible. Right, and, and that sort of, you know, the possibility for, for miscalculation is profound, but I think especially with Russia, the possibility of purposeful miscalculation, you know, uh, we've constantly seen Russia kind of uh, create a false pretext uh, for invasion or for war. And, and, and certainly I think the United States says they're, they're, they had credible intelligence that uh, sort of noted that, you know, they were planning out something similar in Ukraine this time. Um, yeah. But, yeah. but I, I found I find quite interesting. So your point about, you know, the we, we need more lines of communication other than just diplomatic ones and other than just sort of the, the high level US Russia talks. Because frankly, when I see these talks, I mean, it, it doesn't seem like they're, they're exchanging sort of real diplomatic ideas and really trying to understand each other's stances. It seems a lot of bluster, right? Like Russia goes on there and says, makes these sort of list of demands that I think it very well knows will never be accepted. 
um, perhaps more so to create this sort of domestic justification for what they're doing. So, I mean, I think firstly, how what would a more kind of genuine diplomatic process possibly look like, do you think, and how could that be brought about? But also, what sort of non-state, non-diplomatic lines of communication do you think would benefit? That's a good question. I mean, I, I, I would, I would look a bit further into the US-Russian process, and I, I'm not so sure I would agree that it's pure bluster. I mean, the, the Russians are presenting very detailed concerns, which in summary represent, you know, their anxieties about the international system and their supposed encirclement by NATO, which seems to be a, a genuine concern on the part of Putin. One can argue whether it's a, a legitimate concern or not, um, that it is nonetheless his concern. Um, and the process with the Americans is trying to address that. And the Americans have made fairly detailed proposals to try to address that. But um, I don't think that should be the sole avenue of communication. I think other governments need to be talking to Russia. Uh, Ukraine needs to be talking to Russia. Ukraine needs to be talking to its separatists. I mean, part of uh, the problem here is that there hasn't been a political solution to what has happened in eastern Ukraine. Uh, to the Donbass region, to the idea of some limited autonomy, the Minsk process uh, fell apart. Um, and that is one of the triggers of this, this period of tension. Uh, and I think, you know, given that the Ukrainians have most at stake, uh, I would encourage them to engage in their own diplomacy, both with Russia, which I know they are doing, um, but also internally. Um, with their own people, uh, thus removing one of the casus belli uh, that Russia is claiming uh, for its aggression. Mm -hmm. and, and I think you sort of briefly alluded to this, but I think one of the contexts that we so often overlook is, is the domestic context of how these decisions are made. Uh, and certainly, I think in the case of perhaps you know, broadly the West, uh, the US has midterms coming up this year, France has elections coming up in sort of March, April, uh, Germany has profound domestic tensions kind of between this sort of uh, very broad based coalition they have. Um, and, and I'm wondering, I mean, how, how do you see that kind of uh, shaping the process? Well, I, I think inevitably it shapes the process a great, a great deal. Yeah. Um, the Biden administration is on the back foot on the national security agenda after the collapse in Afghanistan, which was a, a great disaster. Uh, for the Biden administration, whether it was preventable or not is another question. Um, but, you know, I think national security is definitely a weak flank for the Republicans to attack. And if the Biden administration is in any way uh, see, seen as weak in standing up to Russia, uh, then that would be a, a net negative for the administration in the coming midterms. So yeah, it plays a huge part um, in forming the American position uh, you know, intra-coalition talks, the, the Germans have yet really to form a coherent unified position on Ukraine um, uh, in the coalition. I think that's inevitable and a, a function of coalition politics, which is, I would argue is actually a good thing in many ways. Uh, but in terms of dealing with Russia, it's not necessarily a good thing. Um, it's complicated, but of course, domestic considerations play a huge part. And here in Britain, we see uh, the British government flouncing around claiming to be a leader in mm. Ukraine diplomacy, which I don't think anybody else sees them. I mean, if you're claim to be, claiming yourself to be the leader, usually not everybody else, nobody else sees you as the leader, um, you know, mainly driven by domestic concerns that the government is under great attack domestically because of the, you know, the buffoonish behaviour of its prime, prime minister. Yeah. I want to talk a bit more about that because I think it's, it's you know, it's one of those things that happens so often. I think we've become a little bit numb uh, to the kind of uh, you know hypocrisy we see in Ten Downing. Um, but I think more broadly, and I, I, you might agree with this, it's, it's symptomatic uh, and emblematic of uh, what's wrong with the way the, the sort of political system works. Um, yeah, what, what do you what do you think about that? You know, the, the fact that uh, we, we've seen Boris Johnson uh, sort of commit these grave acts of incompetence, frankly. Um, but more than that, uh, just sort of, you know, public indecency in, in a sort of, you know, uh, role to and, and a sort of his duty to, to, the, to the public. Um, is that, and I, I saw your Twitter, I think you said something around the lines of, you know, that's, that's possibly a consequence of, 
uh, how much uh, power the prime minister has uh, in doing these mm. sorts of things. Could you elaborate a bit more on that? Well, I don't think Britain is a democracy. Uh, I mean, in one way, it is not a democracy because the prime minister has a obscene amount of power as an individual. Uh, he determines who's in the cabinet. He determines every important political decision by the government, uh, which are not really held to account in the House of Commons because they have a large majority in the House of Commons and the House of Lords is not a proper body of accountability. Um, and the British electoral system tilts towards single party dominance. So that's one way we don't have uh, 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 democracy in the country. I don't regard Boris Johnson as truly representative of the British people in, in any way. Uh, so, you know, he is able to get away with this egregious behavior because he has such extraordinary power over his own party um, as well as over the country. Uh, and it's disgusting, it's disgusting. His behavior has been an, uh, an international embarrassment. Uh, he's lied repeatedly, uh, not only about the parties in number 10, uh, but about many other issues as well, um, including, for instance, whether he sent out a missive that animals should be rescued from Kabul rather than people, um, where you know foreign office officials have testified to that fact, and yet he continues to lie about it. Um, uh, so uh, I, I do think that, you know, we are dealing with essentially an illegitimate government here in the UK, that the constitutional setup in the UK tends towards that illegitimacy. Um, there is a grave need for constitutional reform in Britain to make democracy much more participatory and representative. Mm. Yes, yeah, so we, we've spoken about you know quite a few things that that are sort of clear areas of concern and might you know give give some of our listeners a bit of a hard time going to bed tonight. Just to end off with a little bit of a hopeful note, Karn, is there anything that makes you hopeful about the future? I know I know the the sort of philosophy and sort of the the variant of anarchism uh, kind of you subscribe to is, isn't uh, an ends based philosophy. It doesn't promise utopian vision, um, but is there something that makes you hopeful about the future? Uh, I've always got hope. I'm basically an optimist. Um, I vest great hope in, in ordinary people. Uh, and I don't mean that patronizingly, non-elite people, but I'm just everybody, uh, their good wisdom and good sense, um, particularly young people who I see as non-partisan, you know, non-party political in the traditional way, but actually very politically aware, very alive to the problems that we confront, things like climate change and social injustice, and willing to change it in a very practical way, which is what I'm all in favor of. That's what my anarchism is all about, is, is practically changing, pra practically confronting these problems yourself through your own autonomous action. And I, I see a generation of people emerging who are, perhaps because of the crises that we face, which are severe and really concerning, uh, but they are more active and alive to these concerns than certainly my generation was, which is, you know, very complacent and conservative with the small C generation. So that's what gives me hope. And I mean, certainly these young people, many of them would be listening to this. Would you have, what, what would you say is your one piece of advice to them, you know, say, because a lot of these will, will sort of, you know, because they're interested in foreign affairs, will like you be sort of very fascinated by the FCO, will want to join government. Um, and kind of having seen that process so closely, if you had one piece for, of advice for a young person sort of joining government or joining the FCO, what would that be? Well, look, well if you're an idealist, as you should be, and you want to do good in the world, don't join the FCO. Uh, you know, the interests of government are not the same as doing good. Uh, government claims to be doing good all over the world, but this, this government is supporting the Saudi offensive in Yemen, which is killing civilians every day in numbers. Uh, so if you want to represent that and get involved with that, well, go ahead, join the government. But if you actually want to do some good, think about practically doing some good. Above all, go abroad if you're interested in international relations. You know, don't talk about Turkey or the Kurds or Yemen from as I'm doing from the safe from the comfort of your seat in, in the UK. Get out and engage and learn about these places. There's nothing like that experience of engaging with the quote unquote other it's a deeply enriching and powerful experience um you know my time with independent diplomat working with these groups and governments around the world was was deeply enriching um but don't look to institutions to deliver that experience for you uh, go out and find it yourself
Fascinating. Mr. Con Ross, an incredibly, incredibly engaging discussion, uh, certainly leaving me uh, with a lot to think about. Um, thank you so much for joining us. My pleasure. Thanks for having me. And to our listeners, if you like this episode, then you're going to love Karn's book, Independent Diplomat, Dispatches from an Unaccountable Elite. It's very readable uh, and it's very engaging. And I think it's an intimate uh, account of, of on the front lines of diplomacy, uh, you know, really like no other. Uh, and then that's all for this episode, folks. Stay tuned, stay safe, and I'll see you next week.